Hello and welcome to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. My name is Art and I want to welcome you to the show today. I checked the mail yesterday and in, in my mailbox was a catalog from Amazon and it was their new Christmas catalog that they have started sending out just a couple years ago. I, I think it's been, I have mixed feelings on this. <laughs> you know, we talk with longing and nostalgia about getting the Sears catalog and, and the Christmas uh, wish book, I think it was called, and, you know, going through its pages and circling all the toys that you wanted and somehow Santa would, you know, get you the toy you wanted. Now, I don't want to complain, <laughs> but uh, we would do that and Santa would often drop the ball <laughs> on uh, getting us the gifts that we wanted from from the Sears catalog. I think maybe one or two times it would happen, but I think it mostly gave Santa an idea of what we wanted. So I don't know if I have as much fond memories of that as others do. My memories of childhood are pretty hazy. That's what happens when you turn 43 years old. But uh, yeah, I was taking the kids to school this morning and, and Grace saw the catalog and she got really excited about it. And I I, I don't know, it was kind of neat to see that. She was really begging her brother to hand over the catalog as she wanted to look at it. And of course he had to look through it all first on the, you know, on the way to school and he's turning pages slowly and making comments about the things he sees and stuff like that. And, you know, poor Gracie, she's just like, is there a teddy bear in there? Is there Legos in there? <laughs> and I guess maybe you just have to be that certain age that those are the things that are exciting uh, for you. So I don't know, it's maybe with some a sense of bittersweetness that doesn't excite me like it used to, but it could just be it's because it came from Amazon. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but in any case, I don't know. Have you gotten your Amazon Christmas catalog yet? And what do you think of it? And uh, I did see that there are some Lego sets in there that are like Christmas Village Lego sets. Uh, I got I got to say, I'm really really intrigued about that uh and i would love to get those that uh, for sure uh you know i, I think that would be <laughs> that would make a nice um addition to my bookshelves here uh to have some uh, lego christmas village pieces but uh, yeah let me know if that's something you're excited about or even better send me a story about when you would get the sears catalog if that's something that you experienced i want to start sharing more of the stories from my listeners so you can email me, direct message me, send me a voice recording telling me a story of when you would look through the pages of the catalogs and uh, I'll share that and I'll share that or read that on on an upcoming episode. So today we have a special guest. Uh, I'll be talking with Liz Ireland, who is the author of Mrs. Claus and the Santa Land Slains. And that is a cozy mystery book that I reviewed on the podcast's YouTube channel. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and just look up Cozy Christmas Podcast, uh, will pop up there. And I'm starting to put some more content on there as well as here on the on the podcast. So you might want to check that out. As you saw, might may have seen on the video, I really enjoyed that first one. I don't know if it just hit me at the right time or what, but it was such a fun read. And I'm excited to talk to Liz today. And uh, check out the show notes and you can see where uh, where you can purchase those. And so um, let's welcome Liz Ireland to the Cozy Christmas Podcast. I want to welcome to the podcast today, uh, author Liz Ireland. She has written a wonderful new series that I found that I feel like it's marketed just for me. It's a cozy, cozy mystery with Mrs. Claus as the protagonist. Uh, so if you've ever wondered what Mrs. Claus does all year while Santa's getting ready for Christmas, apparently uh, she solves mysteries now. Liz Ireland, welcome to the Cozy Christmas Podcast. Thanks for having me, Art. I want to tell you the story of how this all ha came, to, came to pass. So uh, I... Usually I'm on the lookout for new mysteries to read and I can't remember where I first saw it, but I saw that there's this mystery series starring Mrs. Claus and I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went and, and I bought a Kindle, I, I bought the Kindle edition of it and, uh, and then uh, through a, a mutual podcast 
uh, that I'm friends with. Anyway, Kensington Press saw that I had a, a Christmas podcast and they asked me if I would be interested in having you on for an interview. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> and so they sent me your books and I already had one. But uh, anyway, long story short, uh, you're here and uh, we're going to talk about your wonderful new series uh, of uh, Mrs. Claus. And the first one I read was uh, Mrs. Claus and the Santa Land Slains. Uh, and uh, what what a great, what a fun book that was. So Thank you oh, for writing. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, and I'm glad you got the book too because you know the cover is, it's mm. very cute. So, uh, and for those who saw my uh, video review, uh, I I really like the cover. It's, it, it, I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm just one of those suckers for uh, the the art marketing department or something. But it's it's simple. It's Christmassy, but it's it's really I don't know. It was clever. Oh, I buy books by their covers all the time. Yeah. So. <laughs> And their yeah. titles. I mean, I, oh. I'm, I'm an easy, easy mark. <laughs> yep. Yep. They see me coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, for uh, folks who don't aren't familiar with you or haven't come across your book yet, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit about uh, who you are and uh, how you came to be writing, uh, writing these books? I grew up in the United States, so I'm, I'm, I'm an American by birth, but now I live in Canada, which is, you know, it, Going from the United States to Canada, it's kind of helped me do the understand Mrs. Claus going to the North Pole a little bit because mm. <laughs> I was raised in Texas and then, you know, lived for 10 years in Montreal. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I know a little bit about snow. I've been publishing for a long time. Um, I have published under uh, several names. Uh, Liz Ireland was originally the name I published uh, romance novels under. That was my first. Uh, when I first published, I started out as a romance writer. And um, I've also published uh, women's fiction and I have a historical mystery series uh, that I write under the name Liz Freeland. But um, a couple of years ago, I hadn't written romances in a while. And I was talking to my editor and we decided we wanted to do a Christmas series, a cozy Christmas series. And so we revived the Liz Ireland pen name because I I look I wrote very uh, light, usually funny mysteries. I mean uh, romances and women's fiction. So it seemed to fit what we wanted to uh, write with the Mrs. Claus mysteries. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm Liz Ireland again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, do you ever get um, like your your name's confused? <laughs> Like, who am I? Oh, today? yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I do. Um, and sometimes I've got so I've got several, uh, you know, uh, Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be, I'll be uh, answering people with the wrong Twitter account. And, you know, it just gets very confusing. <laughs> who am I this time? You know? Yeah. It's just, uh... Well, I, I have to, I have to laugh at that because uh, as my listeners know I started a new podcast and yeah, this is a shameless plug for the other one, but, uh, go for so, it. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I, I will, uh, post the wrong episode on the wrong webpage or, you know, on the wrong social media. And then I'm like, no wait, that's, <laughs> that's yeah. not the Christmas one. That's the mystery or the, the book one. And yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. it's now I, I've become, a, I've become an expert on how to delete things <laughs> yeah. and, and repost. <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, as long as people are seeing it, I guess that's important, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could you go ahead and just give us a little bit of a snapshot as to what your series is about? Okay. The Mrs. Claus series is set in Santa land at the, in the North pole. The, the setup is that uh, Mrs. Claus was running a, a, an inn, a small uh, hotel on the coast of Oregon when she met this, you know, enigmatic bearded man who came to visit <laughs> one week. And uh, they fell in love and uh, had a whirlwind romance. And then he admitted to her that he his in his real life, he is Santa Claus. They were in love, so she decided to get married and and uh, now they're living in, now she's living in Christmas town in Santa land in uh, Castle Kringle, which is where Santa Claus lives. Uh, she has uh, lots of in-law problems <laughs> <laughs> as most newlyweds do yep. and, uh, or some newlyweds do. 
the world of 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 Santa Land is populated by elves, of course. There are lots of elves around. And uh, the Claus family, though, is um, sort of a little like the royal fr- family of Britain. That's sort of how mm-hmm. I envisioned them when I, they're, uh, they've, they've been ruling over Santa Land for a long time. And uh, it's a kind of sprawling family. They live up on the mountain in large chateaus and have elves working for them. And uh, some of them are a little bit uh, what, indolent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the current Santa, who's who's really just it's an inherited title in the in this world. And um, the current Santa, uh, April's husband, has has decided that all clauses need to earn their keep. And so that's creating a little a little conflict up on up on around Kringle Castle. You know, there are also the recognizable Santa Land people like no men. Uh, are 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 in the in the book and reindeer of course reindeer are a big deal and they talk they don't necessarily interact a whole lot with the humans in terms of uh, you know being involved but they they um they're they're more uh, obsessed with their their reindeer games they have a lot going on in terms of yeah. staying in shape because the whole point of the reindeer is they're trying to stay in shape to pull that sleigh on on Christmas and and to get the you know the ones that are in the best shape uh, picked out. So, and yeah. I, I, I based them a little bit on, you know, the old cartoon uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I, I, uh, I use that as some research <laughs> in terms of, uh-huh. of, of how reindeer are. And uh, I always thought the reindeer were kind of jerky in uh, in in Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. Yeah, you're not alone on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um some of them are, are jerks, but some are very nice and uh mm-hmm. and they play an important role there. I really like just the whole culture you oops uh, the whole culture there you created uh and how the reindeer that are there now are like descendants from the original eight, you know, from from the the poem. Yeah. That, and, and there's different herds of <laughs> You know, there's the Ru- Rudolph clan. You know, stuff like that. And uh, I, yeah, I mean, this this whole world is is so. I feel like there's so much potential there that we have yet to explore uh, beyond just the mystery part of it. You know, just the the setting. It's a very rich and and uh, fascinating setting. So, yeah, I, I have fun with it. I'm I'm trying to focus on. You know, sometimes I try to I try to focus on different aspects uh, with each book. Um, in fact, the one I'm writing now is very, uh, the reindeer are, are having a, the reindeer are kind of central to it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I've got reindeer on the brain right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could tell us a little more, uh, I mean, whose idea was it to set it at the North Pole? Was this something you came up with or was it the publishers or was it a kind of a mixed bag? Well, I've had a, the same editor for about 20 years, <laughs> so which is really rare in publishing. So uh, uh, he had approached me about writing a Christmas cozy series, which mm-hmm. you know I was I was really excited about, and um, we started kicking around ideas, and we thought about Mrs. Claus. Uh, he was saying, you know, just Mrs. Claus, you know, it could be, you know, Mrs. Claus. Uh, cosplay person or you know something you know mm-hmm. mrs claus like figure and i i had been writing a, a historical mystery series set in new york in in 1914 and doing a lot of research and i thought i i want to write just complete fantasy you know something that people won't be fact checking <laughs> you know i just <laughs> i'm ready to go to the north pole and just go the whole hog and i just I just uh, had kind of been enthralled to um, a couple of British series like uh, The Crown and Downton Abbey. And I was Mm -hmm. thinking, you know, it would just be so great to create this this kind of fun world where there's kind of an upstairs, downstairs feeling. But it's, you know, clauses and elves and, you know, just create a whole new world. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. I I described it. It was like um, uh, Downton Abbey and... uh... Uh, I don't know, Hallmark movie and a mystery kind of all <laughs> rumbled together. <laughs> and I loved it. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. But, you know, having watched shows like that, it really helped me kind of understand the whole dynamic of who's like the different characters in, in Claw's Castle, you know, the, 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 the matriarch or, or the dowager, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> uh, all the way down to uh, April, who's, uh, I don't know, like a, a fish out of water. <laughs> it is. It's a very fish out of water. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't want to get too much into spoiler territory with the, the plot. Uh, I want people to read it. But what I liked was April is kind of, this is all new and, and different and I'm trying to adjust. But then also, uh, you know, her husband, Santa, Nick, you know, this is new for him too. He's kind of been thrust into this uh, new position as Santa that if I understood right, he didn't really expect to have, you know, it was his older brother was Santa and he was doing a great job and everyone loved him. And, uh, and then you have that problem now where you're having to step in and fill somebody's big shoes, you know? Oh, I know. I'm glad you, you, you picked up on that because I always find, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a hard thing for him, you know, to, he's not, and he's not a natural, I mean, he's not the natural jolly person. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he's, he's doing his best to be a jolly Santa, but his, his brother was really good at it. <laughs> and, uh, and everyone is still, you know, remembering that. And it's, uh, he was, Nick was always the more, uh, I don't know, he, I think he was supposed to be more of, the accountant brother, you know, the guy who was, you know, tending to the books, making everything, m- making sure everything ran well. And, uh, and yeah. now he's had to step into the ceremonial role too. So it's yeah. a big change. Yeah. And that's actually what I, one of the things I liked about the cover of the book is the focus on the, on the shoes and the feet, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, she's trying to wear these and they're, they're not fitting right. You know, she's trying to put these shoes on it. I don't know. It was, I don't know if that was planned or not, but I, I found some symbolism there that yeah. <laughs> it's one of those little details that just delights me. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, here a little bit, just what are, uh, who are some of the characters that uh, we'll meet in uh, your Mrs. Claus book? The castle is full of April's in-laws. Um, so it's her husband, Nick and her mother-in-law, Pamela and the, her brother-in-law Martin and her brother her sister-in-law Lucia who is a reindeer she's sort of the reindeer fanatic of the family who kind of is the advocates for reindeer in all ways and she has a pet Lucia has a pet a reindeer uh who was a misfit (laughs) and uh from the and he has uh Rudolph blood in him um but his name is Quasar and uh he he is her her companion and is often around the castle. So reindeer can come in the castle. Um, it's not always, they're not always the most welcome guests, but uh, Quasar is there a lot. <laughs> and um, the footman or the head footman of the castle, I guess you would say, is uh, named Jingles. Mm-hmm. Jingles is uh, half elf, half human. And uh, he uh, kind of runs the castle and uh, pretty much runs April. Uh, she <laughs> she's, <laughs> yeah. she's dependent on him to keep her going. And uh, over the course of the book and more through the series, he starts seeing himself as a you know master detective. He he likes to get involved and you know solve things. And yeah. Um, so he's uh, he's sort of a martinet. He he kind of loves to command everybody and has strong spiky opinions about everything. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's often her her first sounding board, and she also has a good friend named Juniper, who's an elf. Uh, she run she is an elf uh, librarian, and uh, so she's down in Christmas Town at the library, and she often hears a lot of news. They're in a concert band together, and a lot of a lot of action or goes around the concert band. And I feel like I'm forgetting somebody important. Oh, Constable Kringles. Kringles. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the lawman of, of Christmas um, <laughs> is named Constable Cr- Crinkles. And uh, there's not a lot. Uh, I don't think he has a lot of experience uh, actually solving crimes because it's mm-hmm. Christmas town. So when a murder happens, he's kind of befuddled. He doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. It's not exactly, you know, law and order 
<laughs> down there. So uh, he has his, he's aided by his nephew, a um, lot of nepotism going on there. <laughs> sure. And, uh, and his nephew is Ollie and Ollie enjoys baking at the, at the constabulary. So um, mm. there's always good things to eat at the constabulary and, you know, the, the prisoners are well-fed. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> You might have some committing a crime just to get some good food, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a, another character I, I found interesting was uh, uh, not Jack Frost. He, they Jake, correct. Frost. Jake Frost. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Jake Frost. Yeah. yeah. Distant He's, relation. <laughs> distant relation, right. <laughs> he uh, he shows up to kind of uh, help out the investigation. Um, yes. No, or help or hinder. You know, or... He's sort of a, a film noir detective kind of mm -hmm. plopped into Santa land. We don't really know exactly what he is. He's kind of, he's from the area north of Santa land, which is kind of wild wilderness, a very uh, forbidding looking mountain called Mount Myrrh, which is sort of the mm. Mount, you know, doom of, 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 <laughs> the, of the book. And, uh, it's it's where all the uh, misfits, outcasts, uh, outlaws, uh, abominable snow monsters, uh, various various creatures live, and uh, uh, it's a little little uh, shady, little little scary out there. Mm -hmm. um, but he comes to Santa Land every once in a while to help solve especially difficult crimes, because Crinkles isn't always up to the task. I have to say. Right. Yeah. Poor fella. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's in and over a little, he's in over his head a little, but you know, I, I just always, I just felt sorry for him. Cause I, I, I kind of know what he feels like that, uh, you know, I'm in this little town, things are usually really easy, really uh, <laughs> nothing bad ever happens. And then, Oh, there's this big thing that happened. I don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> I'm yeah. overwhelmed. So <laughs> <laughs> now did, did you find it hard to, uh, to write about Christmas all year? Cause I, I know you probably didn't write it during Christmas time the way books work. Well, maybe, maybe you did. I don't know. <laughs> no. Um, in fact, that's, that's exactly the time when I'm not writing the Mrs. Claus books is usually at Christmas. Cause I usually turn, turn them in, in the fall and mm -hmm. you know, they come out the next fall. So um, actually it's, it's, it's actually pretty fun. And I have to say during the pandemic, it was, when everything was shut down, it was kind of it was kind of wonderful to to just be able to escape into this complete fantasy of 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 Santa Land and elves and talking reindeer and mm -hmm. no man who could move around. It just a, it was a, it was such a such a, a nice thing to do, and it's yeah. kind of fun to to in the middle of July to you know revisit Christmas cartoons and listen to some Christmas music. <laughs> It's, it's a nice escape. <laughs> Another thing too is when I'm writing a book, I don't like to read books or things that are of a similar nature. So mm -hmm. I just, just to keep, you know, I just want to keep other people's stuff out of my head at the, that point. So um, I'll read John Le Carre while I'm, <laughs> I'm writing the Mrs. Cloud's <laughs> books or something. But um, the, uh, so that kind of opens me up to just, uh, I can, I can enjoy Christmas stuff at Christmas time and not, not worry about, you know, having sure. it bleed into my brain. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know I've got some listeners uh, who will listen to Christmas music year round and uh, there and watch Christmas movies year round. So it's certainly not that unusual, at least mm -hmm. <laughs> it might be a little unusual, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, I always thought about trying to create Christmas content outside of Christmas and how easy it is because I, I feel the most Christmassy, you know, at Christmas time, but um, having doing a podcast year round, I, I find it's pretty easy to uh, just slip into that um, mm -hmm. most most of the time. When when it gets real hot outside and real muggy, it's it's maybe pushing it a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what are some of the things that inspire you to to keep going, to keep writing when uh, maybe you might run into a difficulty or uh, I don't know whether it's a st stubborn plot point you can't get through or. Uh, maybe you're you're just not feeling that Christmas spirit when you're trying to write. <laughs> do you mm. do you have uh, any uh, inspiration that you you go to to help get those uh, creative juices flowing? Well, 
I think uh, this happens to me a lot, actually. Uh, it happens usually every book. I, I usually will hit just a wall where I think, I don't know. I You know, you usually get around, I usually hit that mark around two thirds of the way through. I just start thinking, is, is this working? And, you know, you just start feeling like you're in the weeds. A lot of times I just step back from it. I mean, for as much as uh, I know writers always say you're supposed to write every day, but I, I do not write every day. Sometimes I have to step back from it and just work on something else. Uh, I, I read sometimes just, just read other things that I really love. And it kind of reminds me of story and what I like in stories. Mm. I also, uh, I watch a lot of movies and, you know, I always find just, just to get stories going through my head, how to tell stories, the rhythm of stories that really uh, helps me a lot. Another thing that really helps is uh, I have to say, uh, readers really help me a lot. I mean, I know this sounds kind of pathetic and, and, and needy, author needer, needy, but, um, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, it really, when I hear from readers who, you know, out of the blue will, you know, contact me on Facebook or, or Twitter and say, you know, I really love this. When is the next one coming out? I can't wait. And I think ah, there's somebody out there who really is, is connecting to this and, you know, and, and, and it's, it is worthwhile, <laughs> you know, um, so that really can actually pull me out of the dumps quite a bit. Mm. Good. Um, yeah. I can remember getting my first bit of feedback from someone, uh, you know, outside of a podcast community type group that, uh, because there, there's a, a, you know, we have a Christmas podcast network I'm a part of, but then to actually get somebody outside of that, you know, a listener to say, Hey, I, I listened to your episode and I love this, or this meant a lot to me when you said that it's, it's like, wow, <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. You know, that's, it's like, you're, you know, you're like the, I don't know if you know that Horton, here's a who, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and you're on the dust spec yelling out and suddenly somebody hears you and it's great. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is anyone yeah. out there? Yeah. <laughs> so you have, uh, I almost forgot to talk about your, your new book coming out. Is that out this month or did it come out September? Oh, uh, Mrs. That, Claus that... and the Halloween Homicide. Yes. It's it's out. It's, it's, out it's, now. it's available. Okay. It came out uh, last week or the week before. It came out at the end of September. Okay. Um, time is flying by, obviously. I'm, no, I'm sure, yeah. Track. It's uh, Mrs. Claus. It's her second year in uh, Santa Land. And she is a big fan of Halloween, which Santa Land has never... Uh, celebrated. So she has dropped a few hints, thought it would be a fun thing to do. And the elves have really, uh, several elves have really taken up the, the idea of, of, of celebrating uh, Halloween in Santa Land. And um, so there are pumpkins everywhere and they're, they're learning all about, you know, the various scary stories of uh, the human world. But also uh, April is learning that uh, Santa Land has its own kind of mythology and scary stories and uh, things they find frightening, which aren't all, always the same as, yeah. as, as uh, what she's used to. So they're all incorporating various new traditions. And, um, but there are a few elves, especially one elf in particular, Tiny Sparkletoe. Um, he's a big wig in Christmas Town, and he is not pleased at the idea of Christmas Town celebrating another another holiday. So mm -hmm. he's resisting change. Well, I won't say anymore, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, you know, it gets get... brought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading that one. I, I have plans to read it closer to Halloween. So, uh, oh, try, try to tie it into the time of year. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, some of us other, uh, Christmas podcasters, we've been talking about, um, and a lot of people who are fans of Christmas, you know, that follow us also um, are really crazy about Halloween too. And, and oh, so, you yeah. know, we've, we've been talking about why that is. Um, it, it could be just because, you know, any reason to celebrate, we're, <laughs> we're on board. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, also for us, it kind of kicks off the Christmas season. I know it's kind of early for, for some, but, uh, it, you know, it's getting to be fall. The weather's cooling off. The a lot of like I do some uh, Christmas crafty type stuff, so I, I'm doing that those things right now. And you know, it Halloween's coming, so 
already my mind is like oh, Halloween, that's Christmas time. So, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. you know, my sister and I, we always talk about this. It's the, it's the holiday corridor, you know, mm. it's just, it kind of, uh, it starts with, uh, Halloween and it kind of sucks you in from there. You know, you're just, you're, you're entering the, the holiday warp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I, um, I read a lot of Victorian literature and, and I talk about that oh. a lot in my other podcasts and actually this one too. Um, but you know, at, for them at Christmas time, they would read scary stories and mm-hmm. um, the, the, the ghost stories were very much a part of Christmas uh, back then, which seems kind of strange now, at least to Americans uh, because, you know, that's, well, that's two separate holidays, you know, the, the scary stories are for Halloween, but uh, I, I don't know. I wonder if maybe there's a small part of us that still equate the two <laughs> from, from well, way, a little bit, because it's yeah. sort of a supernatural story in itself, Christmas mm-hmm. is, and, uh, you know, it's got mm-hmm. a lot of pagan traditions and I don't know, our, the most famous Christmas story is a ghost story. So, uh, yeah. a Christmas Carol. So it's, uh, and mm-hmm. still one of the best Christmas stories. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always, I, I end up talking about a Christmas Carol. It seems like every episode I bring it up. So <laughs> folks, oh, yeah. folks are going to get tired of me talking about it. But <laughs> yeah. It's well, as I don't know if you can see, but I got all these Dickens books behind me here. Oh, uh, do you, Oh, you like Dickens too. Very yeah, much. I love, yeah. I love Charles Dickens. I love, uh, I love right. Victorian literature. I love Anthony Trollope. I love, uh, yeah. you know, various, various writers of that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trollope is a guy I just came across a couple of years ago uh, and have really, really loved his, his books. So. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, I, He's a very different writer than Charles Dickens, mm-hmm. but um, uh, mm-hmm. he's a lot of, he's, he's a lot of fun in his own way. Cause he, I like him because he always sees the good and really bad people. Mm-hmm. And he always sees the kind of not so good in the, in the really good people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. there are always uh, you know good people who are sort of tempted to misbehave a lot so mm-hmm. it's, i really like his his uh worldview yeah i i love how sometimes he'll address the reader you, you know kind of breaking the fourth yeah. wall and be like now this this is okay don't worry about this character or yeah <laughs> uh, you know i don't know he just kind of comments on his own story and it's, <laughs> it's yeah. hilarious uh, well i i'm so glad to find another uh person who likes Trollope that's that's amazing that's great <laughs> oh yeah I all like um I love all the Barchester books mm-hmm. uh, I haven't read all of the um the Palliser books yet I'm still on the fourth I think yeah. <laughs> so yeah um I used to be able to read more Victorian literature I mean now it, they're they're very long a lot of them so it, mm-hmm. it takes a little more effort um and I just don't have as much time but um hopefully I'll get back to it and that's another thing I love to do over the winter is just yeah. dig into old Victorian literature. Mm. There was something about the, those storytellers back then I really loved. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, like I, I know sometimes the, the lengthy passages of, you know, descriptions of nature or whatever can be a turnoff, mm-hmm. but Oh, I eat that stuff up. That's <laughs> it's yeah. Just, it's honestly, it's like poetry uh, just, in paragraph form so, some of it can yeah. be uh, and and dickens just had a way with uh language that was just you know mm-hmm. his his just descriptions of people are just so succinct and so fun i just uh he's he's really delightful too mm-hmm. and, well and, yeah and, and christmas pops up a lot in his work here and there uh besides the obvious you know <laughs> christmas yeah. carol yeah um uh, but yeah i've enjoyed uh reading some of his work on on the podcast, like uh, for, for this the Christmas ones, I'll often read a, uh, an old Victorian Christmas story or something along with whatever else I'm talking about on the episode. So, but yeah, I like, I've been reading some of his work, some other, I've been finding some old stories I'd never heard of before that are just charming or really sweet. Um, there are a couple ghost stories I read last year at Halloween that were published at Christmas time, because again, you know, it was a, they told ghost stories at Christmas time. And <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, it's really, really fun. Yeah. Well, see, I, I warned you about going off on rabbit trails here. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we found one. <laughs> That's my brain. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, mine too. Yep. Uh, I, I, well, anyway, I better, better <laughs> get, 
<laughs> get back on topic here, but yeah. Um, uh, so uh, you know, kind of, kind of use this as a natural transition here uh, to talk a little bit more just about Christmas itself. So I, I, uh, I have to ask, are, are you a, a super Christmas fan or are you uh, one of those normal people that like it, you know, just in December? <laughs> Uh, well, it's hard to call myself a normal person now because I spend so much time thinking about Christmas <laughs> because yeah. of the Mrs. Claus book. But I would say I'm probably a normal person, and I'm not a big, I'm not a big decorator. I've never, um, I mean, I like lights, and but I, I, um, I'm not a big, uh, you know, breaking out the decorations as soon as possible kind of person. I, I, I do love, I do love. Uh, shopping for presents for people like just fine and i'm bad about doing this all year round i i um you know i love to 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 find the the special thing to send somebody and and often i'll buy something in in august or you know i'll find just the perfect gift in august and by december i'll have completely forgotten about it and i find it the next april and i'm like oh, oh. <laughs> this would have been nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they would have enjoyed this <laughs> Um, yeah. so I, I, I'm always loving, uh, you know, the, the kind of Christmas, uh, you know, sneaky finding things for people kind of, uh, aspect of it. And I love, uh, I love Christmas music and I love, I mean, you can probably tell from Mrs. Claus and the Santa Land Slings. I'm, I love, uh, music in general and, uh, but mm -hmm. Christmas music, I'm, I'm involved with various concert bands or, or was before the pandemic. And, uh, you know, so we would. You know, we do Christmas performances, uh, go to senior homes, do uh, Christmas shows. It's just sort of music was sort of uh, it's sort of the kind of I don't know what connects me, connects me with the season a lot. And I love to listen to, you know, the old old classics like Ella Fitzgerald, Martin, all of those people, too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to ask, do you have uh, you know, a favorite album or a favorite Christmas uh singer that is just your go-to your go-to music no i like i i do like ella fitzgerald i like uh, i like the dean martin christmas mm -hmm. album a lot um mm -hmm. i'm an old classics person i love uh i love old stuff i love old old music and uh old movies and so those are usually my favorites yeah for for music for me it, it kind of runs from old all the way to new stuff um you, you mm -hmm. know i i don't think i've ever actually heard any ella fitzgerald music now that i think about it but um you know the bing crosby the the peanuts um oh, yeah. music uh, that um uh, vince Dur duraldi yeah yeah uh, oh that's that's just a great album uh and then yeah it's great yeah Nora jones has a christmas album coming out this week oh that sounds good uh and yeah. i i love her music uh and i've been saying for a while she should do a christmas album i think i think her style and her voice would really fit well for that but uh yeah i think it's coming out on the 15th this week and uh so that's wow it's gonna be my new album for the year <laughs> yeah that'll be great actually yeah. yeah yeah and she's not paying me to say that so <laughs> Just, you don't have a direct line to Nora. No, no, uh, she doesn't return my calls or anything. So <laughs> I have to start hiding out at her house or something. I don't know. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, I, I've been a fan of hers because I, I kind of like that old style feel. Especially her first album was just wonderful and yeah, uh, really hit what I like and. Uh, but yeah, I, I was glad to see she's doing a Christmas album. And so you mentioned you like uh, old old movies. Do you have a favorite uh, Christmas movie? Um, yeah, I love. I well, it's hard to name one that I don't like. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the do. old classic, but <laughs> right. I, you know, I do love. I mean, we were talking about uh, Charles Dickens. I love, I love the original, the old Scrooge with uh, Alistair Sim from. Mm -hmm. You know, the I think he made it in the fifties. Um, yeah, I think it was fifty one. Yeah, yeah. There's an older version from the United States, but I love the Alistair Sim version. He is Scrooge to me. Mm. Uh, he's perfect, and I just love that story too because it's 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 got one of my favorite kind of character arcs of of the curmudgeon who who learns the error of his ways yeah. <laughs> before it's too late. <laughs> the old Scrooge, uh, you know. Grinch kind of story. 
And I love, uh, oh, a movie called The Shop Around the Corner okay. with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's a romance. It's, it, you know, it has a kind of the denouement is at, at Christmas and it's, it's really sweet and really good movie. I love It's a Wonderful Life. I think that's that's a really great movie. It's it's hard for it's hard to watch as I get older, I think, because it's just so sad at the end. But um yeah. I mean happy sad. I also there's a there's a little lesser known movie called Remember the Night, I think, uh with uh Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. And uh Barbara Stanwyck is a shoplifter who's been thrown in jail and and Fred McMurray is the district attorney who's trying to convict her and through it's it's set at christmas and through a series of you know movie like circumstances he ends up taking her home to indiana from new york he ends up taking her home for christmas to his mm-hmm. little country town it's very hallmarky i think mm-hmm. there's even a you know a square dance or something involved in it. It gets very <laughs> hokey, but it's it's kind of got it's hokey, but it's got its roots in this kind of kind of uh, gritty, you know, story about a shoplifter and a district attorney. Even though it's set in this kind of you know corny corny Indiana, you know, small mm-hmm. town, there's always the threat of what's going to happen when Christmas is over and he has to take her back to New York and convict her for mm-hmm. shoplifting. And uh, so it's it's a really good story. I love that one. Hmm. Oh, wow. I haven't heard of that one. That's, that's yeah, very, good... very compelling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like to ha- ask our, my guests here before, uh, before we head out, but uh, what are, do you have some favorite Christmas traditions or memories uh, from maybe when you were younger or, or even as an adult that you could share with us? I guess my, my favorite Christmas memory is I grew up in Texas, which, you know, we had green Christmases every year. Mm-hmm. And it was just not, not, not a lot of snow, <laughs> but, um, one year there was just this freak snowstorm at Christmas time by coincidence. Uh, my sister's best friend was, had just moved from New York. Um, and she had a toboggan sled. And so, uh, we had never sledded in our lives. So <laughs> <laughs> my family lived next to a little, uh, hill so we had the hill and she had the sled. So she came over and we spent a whole day just sledding down this hill. And it just felt like we were in a courier and knives kind of world all of a sudden. It just, it was mm-hmm. just, it was close to Christmas magic as I think we ever got. <laughs> Even though, I mean, you know, it was still, I remember there was a barbed wire fence at the bottom of the hill. So we all had to bail off the toboggan sled before it hit the bottom yeah. <laughs> of the hill. But, you know, it was, so, it was yeah. just a lot of fun. Yeah. Very Texas-y. <laughs> as as far as tradition thing, I guess I was talking about how I love old movies and mm. uh, <laughs> my newest Christmas tradition this is kind of weird. Christmas is also Humphrey Bogart's birthday, and I'm a big mm. old movie fanatic and Humphrey Bogart fan, and and I always have been. And my mother had had made me this sweater, this big red sweater when I was a teenager, and it had it was hand knit with, and it has Humphrey Bogart's face on the front. Which, which is is very bizarre, but um, I've still got it many, many decades later. And so every Christmas, I, I, you know, I don the red sweater, and um, my husband and I, we always uh, watch a Humphrey Bogart movie on Christmas because it's, you know, it's traditional now. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like some people watch football games or or whatever, but. Uh, well, yeah. I, I'd rather watch a, a Humphrey Bogart movie than football. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's neat. I, uh, I, I love it uh, when you get those non-traditional Christmas or, or you know non-Christmas things uh, as a as a way of celebrating. Still, I don't know. I, I always find that kind of fun. Um, well, it's I, fun too because you've been so immersed in you know Christmas, 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 Christmas songs, and then suddenly mm-hmm. you know I it kind of it kind of just helps decompress. You know, I'm like, oh, I put on the sweater. You know, mm-hmm. I'm stuffed full of food. Now we watch a movie, and it's just a, it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, especially uh, a- after the Christmas dinner, you're you're ready just to conk out on the couch and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> watch yeah. something in black and white. It's easier yep. on your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, I, um, like you, I like the, uh, the Alistair Sim version of Christmas Carol. So, 
Uh, that's usually one I'll watch right on on Christmas or around Christmas if I can, and and just uh, oh yeah, really unwind and and because I I I th- and I, I've told the story before, but I I think it's the first uh, movie version of Christmas Carol I saw. I was pretty young, um, but I remember my, it was my dad's fa- favorite and my grandpa's favorite, so they would watch it together. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna watch this too, and. And that's what I remember is like, you get those feelings of nostalgia is, you know, remember, I remember watching this at Christmas time with my dad and grandpa and, you know, that's oh yeah really special uh, memories around that. So Liz, I just want to thank you for uh, coming on the, the episode today and, and for writing these wonderful books. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're going to get some more in the series. Uh, do, do you plan to, uh, keep writing more in in the future or uh... yeah i'm working on i'm finishing the third one right now and um Mm -hmm. it will be another christmas set one called mrs claus and the evil elves and um Mm. she (laughs) and uh and i think uh next year there will also be a a christmas novella i mean a halloween novella where we're going back to halloween and um it'll be a short a short book included in a halloween anthology yeah. So there are more, yeah. more in the works. Great. Well, um, always just let me know and I'll let folks here know what you're up to and where we can find those things. So, Oh, uh, well, thank you. And I, uh, thank you so much for having me and for, you know, I'm glad you, glad you found my books and really enjoyed them. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was telling my wife about the uh, your first one and we were just laughing because she's like, yeah, this book is just written for you, isn't it? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, I was like, she, she, she just handed me the story. Here you go. This, I wrote it just for you. Well, I found my one audience. There you go. My, my audience person. There you are. Well, uh, thanks for coming on again. Thank you for uh, sharing your stories uh, with all of us. Uh, I, I know some folks have, have uh, picked it up already uh, that listen, but uh, if anyone listening wants to uh, get your book, where can, where can they find it? Well, it's in all the usual places. It's in uh, on Amazon. It's at your local bookstore. I hope. I always say, if you can't, if you don't know where it is, uh, you can go to indiebooks.com, and uh, they will. They usually can locate the closest uh, copy to you. Well, that's that's neat. I didn't. Uh, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, I try to use Bookshop. Uh, dot org i think they, bookshop.org they do, uh, would be good too yeah they yeah they support local bookstores and well, that's a whole other topic but yeah <laughs> we don't have <laughs> we don't have very many uh local uh bookstores near us we have to drive quite a ways to find ones so, yeah that's why you, you know, know these online the online world has been a boon for people who live in in unreachable yeah. you know places <laughs> or places where there aren't a lot of bookstores yep Yep. I'm, I'm out in farm country. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I grew up in, I grew up in a rural area and, and it would have been so great to have Kindles back. (laughs) It would have changed my life. I think. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, I, I was very hesitant to get a Kindle until I I, I got one, just kind of try it out and realized, I mean, Hey, this is still reading. I mean, I'm reading and this is great. And, and now, you know, I can save, luggage space when I go on vacation or something. And I, I like to joke, I can I save space so I can hit bookstores and bring back, you know, <laughs> yeah, bring home books in my luggage now. <laughs> well, and also it's just when I discovered uh, e-reading and looked online and found gutenberg.org and, you know, mm. way back in the, in the old days uh, before it all came onto Amazon, but I just, uh, I was just stunned at all the old books that were out of print that you could suddenly just find with at your mm-hmm. fingertips. It was just amazing to me. So for a, for an old book lover, it's just, uh, it's so great to just be able to think, Oh, I want to read this public domain book and then just be able to, to, to find it at the, right. at, you know, just by search, doing a little internet search because when I was growing up, you'd read about books or see a list of books and you'd think, how am I ever going to find this book? You know, or how am I yeah. ever going to get there? <laughs> and, <laughs> or you'd have to pour through, you know, dusty old used bookstores forever just to find, you know, maybe right. the same author that you were looking for, but not the book or, you know, it was, it's just been a great thing. Although I still love bookstores and I still love used bookstores and 
I still have too many books. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, Liz, thank you again for uh, coming on. And if we don't uh, hear from you until Christmas, we, we're all wishing you have a very Merry Christmas this oh, year. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and uh, thank you for having me. It was a, wonderful to talk to you. Yep, yep, same. Well, you take care. You too. Our story today is called Mr. Bluff's Experiences of Holidays. And it starts out with him saying that he hates holidays. And it was written by Oliver Bell Bunce. He uh, was an American author, an editor, and playwright. He was born in 1828 and died in 1890. And it uh, looks like he... Uh, as I said, he was a editor. He, they had a publishing. He had a publishing house, and he worked for them, uh, and uh, and was an editor for many years uh, before his passing. But this story is quite interesting. It's almost a monologue. The story is written in first person, but it's about Mister Bluff. Mr. Bluff is telling uh, the author the story, and so uh, Bunce is writing it down. is is kind of like telling you what. Mr. Bluff told him with his words, and I just completely butchered that. Anyway, it, it, narratively, it has a really uh, unique style to it, and it, it was a lot of fun to read. Uh, but there's a great message at the heart of the story as well. We find out at the beginning of the story that Mr. Bluff does not like holidays at all. So, yeah, we got a little bit of a Scrooge here, a uh, Scrooge connection. But... Does he stay that way? And what, if he does change, what makes him change? And in that, I think there is a great lesson for us today. So if you're ready, make yourself cozy, and I'll read you another Christmas story. Mr. Bluff's Experiences of Holidays by Oliver Bell Bunce, first published in 1873. I hate the holidays, said Bachelor Bluff to me, with some little irritation, on a Christmas a few years ago. Then he paused an instant, after which he resumed, I don't mean to say that I hate to see people enjoying themselves, but I hate holidays nevertheless, because to me, they are always the dreariest and saddest days of the year. I shudder at the name of holiday. I dread the approach of one, and thank heaven when it is over. I passed through on a holiday the most horrible sensations, the bitterest feelings, the most oppressive melancholy. In fact, I am not myself at holiday times. Very strange, I ventured to interpose. A plague on it, said he, almost with violence. I'm not inhuman. I don't wish anybody harm. But I hate the holidays all the same. You see, this is the reason. I am a bachelor. I am without kin. I am in a place that did not know me at birth. And so, when holidays come around, there is no place anywhere for me. I have friends, of course. I don't think I've been a very sulky, shut-in, reticent fellow. And there is many a board that has a place for me. But not at Christmas time. At Christmas, the dinner is a family gathering, and I've no family. There is such a gathering of kindred on this occasion, such a reunion of family folk, that there is no place for a friend, even if the friend be liked. Christmas, with all its kindliness and charity and goodwill, is, after all, deuced selfish. Each little set gathers within its own circle, and people like me, with no particular circle, are left in the lurch. So you see, on the day of all the days in the year that my heart pines for good cheer, I'm without an invitation. Oh, it's because I pine for good cheer, said the bachelor sharply interrupting my attempt to speak, that I hate the holidays. If I were an infernally selfish fellow, I wouldn't hate holidays. I'd go off and have some fun all to myself, somewhere or somehow. But you see, I hate to be in the dark when all the rest of the world is in light. I hate holidays because I ought to be merry and happy on holidays and can't. Don't tell me, he cried, stopping the word that was on my lips. I tell you, I hate holidays. The shops look merry, do they, with their bright toys and their green branches? 
The pantomime is crowded with merry hearts, is it? The circus and the show are brimful of fun and laughter, are they? Well, they all make me miserable. I haven't any pretty-faced girls or bright-eyed boys to take to the circus or the show. And all the nice girls and fine boys of my acquaintance have their uncles or their granddads or their cousins to take them to those places. So if I go, I must go alone. But I don't go. I can't bear the chill of seeing everybody happy and knowing myself so lonely and desolate. Confound it, sir, I've too much heart to be happy under such circumstances. I'm too humane, sir, and the result is I hate holidays. It's miserable to be out, and yet I can't stay at home, for I get thinking of Christmas's past. I can't read. The shadow of my heart makes it impossible. I can't walk, for I see nothing but pictures through the bright windows and happy groups of pleasure seekers. The fact is, I have nothing to do but to hate holidays. But will you not dine with me? Of course, I had to plead engagement with my own family circle, and I couldn't quite invite Mr. Bluff home that day when Cousin Charles and his wife and Sister Susan and her daughter and three of my wife's kin had come in from the country all to make a merry Christmas with us. I felt sorry, but it was quite impossible, so I wished Mr. Bluff a merry Christmas and hurried homeward through the cold and nipping air. I did not meet Bachelor Bluff again until a week after Christmas of the next year when I learned some strange particulars of what occurred to him after our parting on the occasion just described. I will let Bachelor Bluff tell his adventure for himself. I went to church, said he, and was as sad there as everywhere else. Of course, the evergreens were pretty and the music fine, but all around me were happy groups of people who could scarcely keep down Merry Christmas long enough to do reverence to Sacred Christmas. And nobody was alone but me. Every happy paterfamilias in his pew tantalized me, and the whole atmosphere of the place seemed so much better suited to everyone else than me that I came away hating holidays worse than ever. Then I went to the play and sat down in a box all alone by myself. Everybody seemed on the best of terms with everybody else, and jokes and banters passed from one to another with the most good-natured freedom. Everybody but me was in a little group of friends. I was the only person in the whole theater that was alone. And then there was such clapping of hands and roars of laughter and shouts of delight at all the fun going on upon the stage, all of which was rendered doubly enjoyable by everybody having somebody with whom to share and interchange the pleasure, that my loneliness got simply unbearable, and I hated holidays infinitely worse than ever. By five o'clock, the holiday became so intolerable that I said I'd go and get a dinner. The best dinner the whole town could provide. A sumptuous, a sumptuous dinner, for one. A dinner with many courses, with wines of the finest brands, with bright lights, and a cheerful fire, with every condition of comfort, and I'd see if I couldn't for once extract a little pleasure out of a holiday. The handsome dining room at the club looked bright, but it was empty. Who dines at this club at Christmas but lonely bachelors? There was a flutter of surprise when I ordered a dinner, and the few attendants were, no doubt, glad of something to break the monotony of the hours. My dinner was well served. The spacious room looked lonely, but the white snowy cloths, the rich window hangings, the warm tints of the walls, the sparkle of the fire and the steel grate gave the room an air of elegance and cheerfulness. And then the table at which I dined was close to the window, and through the partly drawn curtains were visible centers of lonely, cold streets, with bright lights from many a window, it is true. But there was a storm, and snow began whirling through the street. I let my imagination paint the streets as cold and dreary as it would, just to extract a little pleasure by way of contrast from the brilliant room of which I was apparently sole master. I dined well and recalled in fancy old, youthful Christmases, and pledged mentally many an old friend, and my melancholy was mellowing into a low, sad undertone, when, just as I was raising a glass of wine to my lips, I was startled by a picture at the window pane. It was a pale, wild, haggard face in a great cloud of black hair pressed against the glass. As I looked, it vanished. 
with a strange thrill at my heart, which my lips mocked with a derisive sneer. I finished the wine and set down the glass. It was, of course, only a beggar girl that had crept up to the window and stole a glance at the bright scene within, but still the pale face troubled me a little, and threw a fresh shadow on my heart. I filled my glass once more with wine, and was again about to drink, when the face reappeared at the window. It was so white, so thin, with eyes so large, wild, and hungry-looking, and the black, unkempt hair into which the snow had drifted formed so strange and weird a framed picture that I was fairly startled. Replacing, untasted, the liquor on the table, I rose and went close to the pane. The face had vanished, and I could see no object within many feet of the window. The storm had increased and the snow was driving in wild gusts through the streets, which were empty, save here and there a hurrying wayfarer. The whole scene was cold, wild, and desolate, and I could not repress a keen thrill of sympathy for the child, whoever it was, whose only Christmas was to watch in cold and storm the rich banquet ungratefully enjoyed by the lonely bachelor. I resumed my place at the table, but the dinner was finished, and the wine had no further relish. I was haunted by the vision at the window, and began, with an unreasonable irritation at the interruption, to repeat with fresh warmth my detestation of holidays. One couldn't even dine alone on a holiday with any sort of comfort, I declared. On holidays, one was tormented by too much pleasure on one side and too much misery on the other. And then, I said, hunting for justification of my dislike of the day, how many other people are, like me, made miserable by seeing the fullness of enjoyment others possessed? Oh, yes, I know, sarcastically replied the bachelor to a comment of mine. Of course, all magnanimous, generous, and noble-souled people delight in seeing other people made happy, and are quite content to accept this vicarious felicity. But I, you see, and this dear little girl— uh, Dear little girl? Oh, I forgot, said Bachelor Bluff blushing a little, in spite of a desperate effort not to do so. I didn't tell you. Well, it was so absurd. I kept thinking, thinking of the pale, haggard, lonely little girl on the cold and desolate side of the window pane, and the overfed, discontented, lonely old bachelor on the splendid side of the window pane, and I didn't get much happier thinking about it, I can assure you. I drank glass after glass of the wine, not that I enjoyed its flavor any more, but mechanically, as it were, and with a sort of hope thereby to drown unpleasant reminders. I tried to attribute my annoyance in the matter to holidays, and so denounced them more vehemently than ever. I rose once in a while and went to the window, but could see no one to whom the pale face could have belonged. At last, in no very amiable mood, I got up, put on my wrappers, went out, and the first thing I did was to run against a small figure crouching in the doorway. A face looked up quickly at the rough encounter, and I saw the pale features of the window pane. I was very irritated and angry, and spoke harshly. And then, all at once, I am sure I don't know how it happened, but it flashed upon me that I, of all men, had no right to utter a harsh word to one oppressed with so wretched a Christmas as this poor creature was. I couldn't say another word but began feeling in my pocket for some money. And then I asked a question or two, and then I don't quite know how it came about. Uh, isn't it very warm here? exclaimed Bachelor Bluff, rising and walking about and wiping the perspiration from his brow. Well, you see, he resumed nervously, it uh, was very absurd, but I did believe the girl's story. The old story, you know, of privation and suffering and all that, and and just thought I'd go home with the brat and see if what she said was all true. And then I remembered that all the shops were closed and not a purchase could be made. I went back and persuaded the steward to put up for me a hamper of provisions, which the half-wild little youngster helped me carry through the snow, dancing with delight all the way. And isn't this enough? Not a bit, Mr. Bluff. I must have the whole story. I declare, said Bachelor Bluff, there's no whole story to tell. A widow with children in great need, that was what I found. They had a feast that night and a little money to buy them a load of wood and a garment or two the next day. 
and they were all so bright and so merry and so thankful and so good that when I got home that night, I was mightily amazed that instead of going to bed sour at holidays, I was in a state of great contentment in regard to holidays. In fact, I was really merry. I whistled. I sang. I do believe I cut a caper. The poor wretches I had left had been so merry over their unlooked-for Christmas banquet that their spirits infected mine. And then I got thinking again. Of course, holidays had been miserable to me, I said. What right had a well-to-do lonely old bachelor hovering wistfully in the vicinity of happy circles when all about there were so many people as lonely as he, and yet oppressed with want? Good gracious, I exclaimed, to think of a man complaining of loneliness, with thousands of wretches yearning for his help and comfort, with endless opportunities for work and company, with hundreds of pleasant and delightful things to do, just to think of it. It put me in a great fury at myself just to think of it. I tried pretty hard to escape from myself and began inventing excuses and all that sort of thing, but I rigidly forced myself to look squarely at my own conduct. And then I reconciled my conscience by declaring that if ever after that day I hated a holiday again, might my holidays end at once and forever. Did I go and see my protégés again? What a question. Why, well, no matter. If the widow is comfortable now, it is because she has found a way to earn without difficulty enough for her few wants. That's no fault of mine. I would have done more for her, but she wouldn't let me. But just let me tell you about New Year's, the New Year's Day that followed the Christmas I've been describing. It was lucky for me there was another holiday only a week off. Bless you, I had so much to do that day that I was completely bewildered, and the hours weren't half long enough. I did make a few social calls, but then I hurried them over, and then hastened to my little girl, whose face had already caught a touch of color, and she, looking quite handsome in her new frock and her ribbons, took me to other poor folk, and, well, that's about the whole story. Oh, uh, as to the next Christmas, well, I didn't dine alone, as you may guess. It was up three stairs, that's true, and there was none of that elegance that marked the dinner of the year before, but it was merry and happy and bright. It was a generous, honest, hearty Christmas dinner that it was, although I do wish the widow hadn't talked so much about the mysterious way a turkey had been left at her door the night before. And Molly, uh, that's the little girl, and I had a rousing appetite. We went to church early. Then we had been down to the five points to carry the poor outcasts there something for their Christmas dinner. In fact, we had done wonders of work, and Molly was in high spirits, and so the Christmas dinner was a great success. Oh, no, dear me, sir, no, just as you say, holidays are not in the least wearisome anymore. Plague on it! When a man tells me now that he hates holidays, I find myself getting very wroth. I pin him by the buttonhole at once and tell him my experience. The fact is, if I were at a dinner on a holiday and anybody should ask me for a sentiment, I should say, God bless all holidays. And that was Mr. Bluff's Experiences of the Holidays by Oliver Bell Bunce. That was <laughs> such a sweet story, and Again, very adjacent to A Christmas Carol. You can kind of see some of that influence there, I think. But still, a great message he gives us in the story. I mean, it, it's a charming story on its own, but here we have a man who's very unhappy and lonely, especially at the holiday time. And he learns to solve that problem by giving of himself to others. He, he gives of his... Finances, sure, but I, I also he's giving up his time, which I'm beginning to think more and more that that is something of even greater value than giving away money, is to give your time to someone, to invest in them with your 
experiences with your time. And so I want to, I, this story can be a lesson to us that if maybe we're feeling kind of down and out this year, if we're feeling discouraged or maybe like Mr. Bluff, we find ourselves hating the holiday season, there can be a lot of reasons for that. But maybe what we need to do then is to look beyond ourselves and our present situation, whether your situation is legitimately painful or not. You know, I know there are people who have Christmas, the Christmas season isn't happy for everyone. And I, I understand that. And there can be some good reasons for that. And there can be some selfish reasons for that. But when we find ourselves tending that way, I would love for you and for me to say, all right, let's get the focus off of myself. What can I do to make somebody else's Christmas a special time? And as we're heading into, uh, we're in October now and heading more towards the Christmas season, there's going to be more and more opportunities for us to give of our, to, to give to charities, to give of our time, to, to help those in need. And I, I really would love to encourage you all to, to do that and do that more. I think showing that kindness to those who are in need, especially if you have a way to fill that need, you can dramatically change a person's life for the better. But uh, I kind of, I just kind of like this story. Mr. Bluff is that, you know, grumpy old bachelor at Christmas and he's alone, but he then makes a deliberate choice. I'm going to go out and seek human companionship. There, I'm not the worst creature in the world, he says to himself. There is somebody here who's obviously in worse shape than I am. You know, he, he begins to look that, yeah, I might be alone, but I have this warm place. I have a lot of food. I have money. I'm taken care of. And then he sees this little child who is begging on the streets, or, or worse, perhaps, and steps in to help their family. Uh, she's a widow. She has children. Oh, just destitute. And there are people like that still. I, and I'm like, no kidding, there are. Yeah. <laughs> but there are. And let's not turn a blind eye to that. Yeah, I know there's scam artists out there and people just trying to either be lazy or take advantage of your kindness and all that. But often we can let that be an excuse to not do the right thing. Anyway, that's my thoughts on, on that story and the lesson we can learn from it. I hope you did enjoy it and that it'll give you some food for thought to look ahead this Christmas season on how you can give the gift of Christmas joy to others. I want to thank you for uh, tuning in today. If you enjoyed what you heard, I would love for you to leave a, a, a review and rating on uh, your podcatcher of choice, wherever you can leave such things that helps out our show. Be sure to keep an eye on our YouTube channel if you haven't subscribed yet. Um, the links will be in the show notes and uh, I, I will be posting some videos of book reviews and different other things here throughout the next uh, this, this coming Christmas season as we get closer to the big day. Hopefully now go into a weekly format uh, until Christmas. Uh, things last week got real busy already just right off the start of October and just didn't get a time to get it out. So hopefully from here on out we'll be coming to you every week between now and Christmas. I have some great guests lined up, some stories to read, and so much more fun, cozy Christmas time. Also, if you want to check out the show notes, you can find some ways to uh, help support the show financially. You can uh, do that at ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com backslash cozy Christmas. And for the price of a cup of coffee, you can support the show and you'll also get a, a bookmark for any donation you make. As well, I have a link to my Etsy store. I have some podcast merch there. Although I am working on some more t-shirt designs of specifically of uh, Cozy Christmas logos, but I'm still kind of working on that. But uh, So keep an eye out for that. But I will be posting if I have not already. I've been busy painting some Christmas ornaments. So until we meet again, I want to remind you to be, to be kind to each other, to do good. And remember that there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. Have a very... Merry Christmas.